hey, I don't know about you, but there are so many new diabetes medications out there, I just can't keep them straight. And they all have super weird names. So I thought it might be helpful for us to do a quick rundown of what those medications are and how they work so that you can take better care of your patients. So here you go, diabetes medicines, journal feed style. And let's get right into it. You know, as we know, diabetes is a problem with abnormal carbohydrate metabolism, which is gonna lead to hyperglycemia. And it is a relative or absolute impairment of insulin secretion with varying levels of peripheral resistance to insulin. Now we all know that diabetes presents with the classic polydipsia. There's also gonna be the polyuria and the polyphagia. But don't forget, there's also often blurred vision and some weight loss. Real quick, we're gonna to touch on how diabetes is diagnosed. A1C, if it's 6.5 or greater, a fasting glucose that's eight hours of 126, or a two hour glucose challenge of greater than 200, or if you have classic symptoms of polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, and a random glucose over 200, that's gonna get you there. Now type one diabetes, real quickly, rapid onset, usually childhood, it's auto antibodies. There's usually not a family history and these patients are gonna need insulin right away. Oral agents are not gonna work. As opposed to type 2 diabetes, which usually develops more gradually, it is more often in adults. It's associated with obesity and sometimes signs of insulin resistance like acanthosis nigricans, and it's often going to have a family history, and these oral agents are going to work, usually. Now, there's also this latent autoimmune diabetes in adults. It's a form of type 1 diabetes that's going to be more gradual in onset eh, around age 30. They're going to have autoantibodies as well. There may be uh, an association with being overweight, but not necessarily obese. And there usually is a family history of autoimmunity, and they are going to need insulin eventually, but oral agents may work at the beginning. Let's talk about how glucose metabolism works. So the first thing is your brain tells you you're hungry and you need to eat. Then your stomach, depending on how quickly it empties, is going to start making you feel full. So if it emptied more slowly, you'd feel full more quickly. Now the pancreas, the islet cells are going to release insulin. That's going to help bring glucose down. The muscle and the adipose tissue are going to take up glucose in the periphery. The liver is going to help you by producing glucose when you're fasting and by saving glucose as glycogen when you're eating. The kidneys can help lose glucose whenever that level gets over 180, so you can pee out glucose. There are diabetes drugs that target each aspect of glucose metabolism. Metformin is the first line drug. It's mainly gonna work by reducing absorption in the intestines and by decreasing hepatic production of glucose and by sensitizing the muscle to utilize glucose by reducing insulin resistance. Metformin, it's a first line drug in type two diabetes. It's nice because it's gonna help you lose weight. You're not gonna get hypoglycemic and it's pretty dirt cheap. Although it is gonna cause some GI side effects when you first start it, they usually get better with time. Very rarely, it can cause this weird lactic acidosis in patients that are already predisposed to lactic acidosis, usually when they have like advanced liver disease. The next is GLP-1 agonists. These are agents that are gonna tell the brain, hey, you're full, stop eating. They may increase a little bit of pancreatic insulin secretion and they're going to slow gastric emptying, so you feel full. They're gonna end in TIDE, T-I-D-E. Again, they're simulating the effects of glucagon-like peptide 1. That's a hormone that's secreted after you eat. These are second-line medications for type 2 diabetes after you've started metformin. They're going to help you lose weight a lot. They're not going to make you hypoglycemic, and they may protect from heart disease. The downside is they're going to cause some nausea, vomiting. They're pretty pricey, and they're injectable and not oral at this point. You shouldn't use them if they have pancreatitis. And here's some examples. As you can see, there's one on this list that is all the rage in the news these days. Next up is SGLT2 inhibitors. So for me, the kidney is a bit of a black box. Somehow red blood goes in and yellow pee comes out. It's kind of mysterious. But to drill down on this, we're gonna look at the proximal tubule. Now in the proximal tubule of the kidney, there's a pee side and then there's a blood side, which is what's ultimately gonna go back into the bloodstream. Now there's an SGLT2 co-transporter that takes sodium and glucose, and it takes this from the pea side back to the blood side. Now this makes sense because 
If you peed out all your carbohydrates, you'd lose that as an energy source. So you want to reabsorb that. Well, the SGLT2 inhibitors block that process. They're like, not today. And so you end up peeing out more glucose, which is kind of a good thing if you have too much glucose already. Now, as you can imagine, if you have more of these molecules on the pee side, that's also going to be an osmol, which is going to act as a diuretic. So that's how they work. Their second line after metformin, here's some advantages. They're going to cause you to lose weight. They're not going to risk hypoglycemia, and they may provide some mortality benefit in patients that have heart failure. The downside is, since they're a diuretic, they're going to risk dehydration, increase fracture risk, may increase risk of infection, and they may increase the risk of amputation. So yeah, if you have peripheral vascular disease, probably you should use a different drug, or if you're on dialysis. They also have this really weird precaution that they could cause euglycemic DKA. Yes, DKA with a normal glucose. Here are some examples. Empagliflozin, kenagliflozin, dapagliflozin, urticlifluzin. There you go. Next is the sulfonylureas. Sulfonylureas basically take the islet cells and whip them and say, make more insulin. So that's how they work. And they all end in zide or ride. Their second line drugs, after metformin, they're going to lower your A1C and they're pretty darn cheap. The downside is they're going to make you gain weight and they have a high risk of hypoglycemia. So these are drugs that you really should not use in older people. And if they get hypoglycemic, they're going to stay hypoglycemic for a while. You should probably admit them. Here are some examples, glimepiride, glipizide, or gliburide, zide and ride. Next is DPP-4 inhibitors. These are drugs that take proteins like GOP-1 or GIP and protect them from breakdown by peptidases like DPP-4. So when you have more GLP-1 and GIP, it has the same effect as like we talked about before with the GLP-1 agonists. It's gonna make you feel more full, increase insulin release, and slow gastric emptying. These would be a second line drug. They have very low side effects. They can be taken orally. They're not gonna risk hypoglycemia, the downside is they're not as much bang for your buck as far as lowering A1C, and you're not going to lose weight with these agents. You really should avoid them in heart failure. Here are some examples of some of these medications, such as citagliptin, saxagliptin, alagliptin, monagliptin. Next is pioglitazone. Pioglitazone is basically going to take your adipose and muscle tissue and increase its sensitivity to insulin, so they will take up glucose better. The thiazolidinediones always end in glitazone. And there's really only one that's in use right now, and that's pioglitazone. Rosaglitazone is kind of falling out of favor. They are third line drugs after you start metformin in type two diabetes. They're not gonna risk hypoglycemia. They are given orally, but they're gonna make you gain weight, increase fracture risk, and cause edema. So you really wanna avoid them in patients that are osteoporotic or have heart failure. So pioglitazone is an example. That's the one that's mainly used. Now. Here's a table of all of these oral medications together. And I want to point out a couple of things. Metformin is going to make you lose weight. The GLP-1 agonists, same. And the SGLT2 inhibitors, same deal. Now, the DPP-4s, you're not going to lose weight, but you're also not going to gain weight. But notice, with the sulfonylureas and the glitazones, you're going to gain weight. Let's talk about different types of insulin. Insulin, well, I'm not even going to tell you how it works. You should know this. Where does it fit? Anybody with type 1 diabetes is going to need insulin, and it's really good for patients with type 2 diabetes that are not getting adequate control of their A1C. You can basically keep pushing the A1C lower and lower with insulin. The downside is it's going to cause you to gain weight, and of course, it's insulin. It's going to put you at risk for hypoglycemia. There's not really a condition for which you really can't use insulin. So the short-acting insulins, first of all, would be insulin aspart, the FIASP preparation. It's ultra-rapid onset, two and a half to five minutes, and it's going to be around for three to five hours. The other three are insulin Lispro, Hemolog, insulin aspart, the Novolog preparation, and insulin glulosine, Epidra. Those are going to have onset in five to 15 minutes and be around for three to six hours. Regular insulin is also considered short-acting. That's going to be humulin R, novelin R. It's going to act in about 30 minutes and be around for 6 to 10 hours. 
Now, there's longer acting insulins as well. NPH, or noblin N, humulin N, is going to be around for up to 18 hours. Insulin detamir, or lavamir, is going to be around mm, 14 to 24 hours. Insulin glargine, or lantus, is going to be around a little longer, up to 24 hours. Insulin glargine with a different preparation like 2GO, or 2GO, who knows. It's going to be around for over 24 hours. And then insulin deglutec, or traceba, it'll be around for at least 24 hours and probably a lot more. Here's a fun fact. NPH stands for neutral protamine hagedorn. What? It was named after its 1946 creator, Hans Christian Hagedorn. And I really am not sure why he appears blue in this Wikipedia picture. So let's summarize the insulin types real quick here. If we have a short acting agent like Aspart, Lispro, or Glulacine, it's going to be around for about six hours and peak pretty quickly in about 15 minutes. Humulin R or regular, that's going to peak in about 30 minutes and be around for up to 10 hours. In pH, it could be around for as long as 18 hours and it's going to have a more gradual onset. Insulin detamir, it's going to be around for up to 22 hours and also have a gradual onset. And glargine, it's going to be around for even longer than 24 hours. Now you might say to yourself, how in the world am I going to remember this? Because here's how this is going to present. You're just going to see a medication on a med list for a patient. And then you're going to have to remember, what is this medication and how does it work? For example, semaglutide or ozempic, that's going to be on the med list. And you're going to say, I do not remember what this medicine is or what it does. But then you're going to remember it ends in tide. And when it ends in tide, you're going to think tide. Tides are made of water. I gulp water, GLP-1 agonist. And then you're going to think, GLP-1 agonist, that is going to make you feel full and tell your brain you're full and slow gastric emptying. And so, low tide, low weight. Next, you're going to see a med like this in Paclofluzin and you're going to say, darn, I don't remember what that is. But then you're going to remember it ends in Flozin and anything that ends in Flozin leads to increased flows in the kidney. When you take in sodium and glucose, flows in, flows in the kidney. You see what I did there? So that's going to be an SGLT2 inhibitor, which is going to decrease glucose reabsorption in the proximal tubule and act as a diuretic. And it's going to have this weird thing that you need to know about, euglycemic DKA. Here's another one, glimepiride. You're going to say, oh, I don't remember what this is, but it ends in ride. And so grandma is going to have to ride to the hospital with her hypoglycemia, and you're going to have to decide to admit her. So finally, ureas whip those islet cells and make them produce more insulin. So you're going to have weight gain and hypoglycemia. Next is citagliptin. You're going to say, I do not remember this, but it ends in glyptin. Glyptin is going to get zipped in a bulletproof vest to protect that hormone from degradation. It's a DPP-4 inhibitor, and that's going to reduce the degradation of hormones like GLP-1 or GIP. And those are going to have lots of different effects on the body to lower glucose. We put together a quiz on our community channel. So go to our YouTube channel, go under the tab that says community, and you can test your knowledge on these different agents. So there you go. That's the journal feed version of diabetes medicines.